All right. Well, we will go ahead and get started with our discussion. Um, thank you so much for everybody attending here today. I'm Jennifer Barrera, uh, Executive Vice President with the California Chamber of Commerce. And of course, our guest of honor here today is Senator Tom Umberg, uh, who we have the pleasure to have a very virtual and kind of town, home, uh, town hall discussion. So thank you, Senator, for being here. Um, I'm also going to uh, do a brief introductions of all of our panelists and speakers. So if you can just bear with me for a moment, but just some ground rules real quick. So everybody knows one, we are recording this event. Um, so just so you are aware of that. And then two, for the attendees who are participating, uh, we don't have the unmute or the live question uh, function available, but you are welcome to submit questions and comments through the chat uh, box and I will be monitoring those. And hopefully we can get as many questions asked and answered um, as we have time for today during our event. So with that, I'm going to jump into introductions and do some brief intros of our speakers and panelists. First, of course, Senator Umberg is here with us today. He represents Senate District 34 down in Southern California. Some of the highlights that I'm gonna go through in his bio certainly won't do justice to his entire background. One, he uh, served in the military and received a bronze star for his uh, service in the military. He was also a federal, a federal criminal prosecutor and uh, successfully 100% conviction rate where he took over 100 cases uh, to trial and judgment. That's pretty amazing. Um, and he also served as a deputy drug czar for President Bill Clinton, where he was responsible for foreign drug policy, counter drug intelligence. Um, and he's also most relevant for California Chamber of Commerce, a small business owner down in Orange County, where he has a successful boutique law firm that's been recognized as one of the preeminent law firms down in Southern California. So, Senator, again, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Jennifer. In fact, I'm sitting in my small business right now. <laughs> that's great. Uh, also with us here today are our partners, our local chambers um, who are in Senate District 34. Uh, first, we'll start off with Memory Bartlett. Uh, Memory is the CEO and president of the Fountain Valley Chamber of Commerce. Her background is in event management and planning where she's put on several successful events down in Orange County. Uh, for the past three years, she's been the CEO and president of the local Chamber of Commerce for Fountain Valley and is really focused on increasing their membership and really helping small businesses navigate the challenges they faced as a result of the pandemic. So thank you, Memory, so much for being here. We appreciate it. Also with us here today is Cindy Spindle. Cindy is the CEO and president of the Garden Grove uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Cindy's background is in housing and development. She worked for um, several housing developers uh, for residential homes, which obviously is a great background for one of the key issues facing the state of California right now. Um, she has worked as the CEO and president of the Garden Grove Chamber of Commerce for the last six and a half years. Thank you so much, Cindy, for being here as well. And then we have uh, John Villa, who is the chair-elect interim CEO for the Huntington Beach Chamber of Commerce. John's background is in technology management, where he's worked on um, issues related to aerospace, consumer electronics, IP management. Um, he's also done pro bono work for medical device, health products, consumer electronics. In addition to being the chair-elect and interim CEO of the Huntington Beach Chamber of Commerce, he is also the executive director for the Huntington Beach Wetlands Conservancy. Thank you so much, John, for being here. Thank you, Jennifer. And last but not least, we have uh, Manny Govea. Did I do that right, Manny? I got it. It was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Manny is on the board of directors for the Los Alamitos, Long Beach, Sill Beach, and Montebello Chamber of Commerce. He is also the West Area Municipal Manager for the Republic Services that provides uh, services for solid waste and recycling down in Southern California. Before that, he worked in uh, government for 10 years for uh, US Senator Dianne Feinstein, uh, California State Senator Carol Liu, and also worked on the Upper San Gabriel Valley Municipal Water District. Thank you so much, Manny, for being here. Thank you. Okay, with those introductions, we're going to go ahead and just get uh, into the discussion. Uh, and Senator, we're just going to kind of uh, hit you with questions from all of the panelists <laughs> as we go along. I'll I'm be ready. here to moderate and right. fill in. Yeah, so don't feel like the chaos going on, but hopefully it'll be a great conversation. Um, we'll go ahead and start with Memory, who will start off our discussion. Go ahead, Memory. Hello, thank you again for being here with us today, Senator. Um, you know, we are all here representing the local chambers, and as such, we are very interested in the economic recovery um, from the COVID pandemic. So I wondered, um, some of my questions are gonna be based on that trend. Um, 
the American Rescue Plan was passed not too long ago um, that had set aside money for local cities and counties. Do you know what the progress is on that and how soon we can expect to get some of that money to the chambers and to the local businesses? So let, let me, first of all, thank you before I answer your question. Um, and Jennifer didn't introduce herself, uh, but, and maybe all of you know Jennifer, Jennifer is a very effective advocate in Sacramento for the chamber and business interests. At, you would call her a power player in, in Sacramento. So thank you, Jennifer, for, for organizing this. Uh, and for uh, some of you know, this is sort of my third stint in the legislature. Uh, and I think most legislators think they know everything after one term, but I've had long breaks in service. So I'm still learning. And the chambers, the various chambers have been very helpful to me in, in basically learning what the needs, interests are of the people that we all care about. We're all in the same business. We're all in the same business, uh, a service business. And, and to your question, Memory, in terms of, of when the uh, federal funding, the, the next tranche of federal funding is going to be in people's pockets, I don't have an answer to that question, but we will get you an answer to that question, at least as best as we can know. Um, some things are unknowable or they're known only to the extent that the, the bureaucracy and the wheels in the bureaucracy turn. Um, we've had our own huge challenges in California, and I'm happy to talk about our, our challenges with EDD. It's a little different question than the one you asked. That's making sure that, that people who are unemployed or underemployed are, are getting the support that they deserve and making sure that those who don't deserve any support, they're called criminals, uh, don't, don't basically benefit from the largesse of taxpayers in, in California. But I, I don't know. I, I, in terms of economic recovery, um, we can talk about some things that, that we're doing in our office and I'm doing. Um, and you, thank you very much, Jennifer. The chamber testified on behalf of one of my bills yesterday. Happy um, to. SB 49. <laughs> yeah. And what SB 49 does, and I'm just kind of proud to remember my own bill number, but what, what SB 49 does is it provides uh, a tax credit for expenditures that businesses have had to uh, spend uh, for governmental fees, like ABC fees, business license fees, those kinds of things. And we've already been somewhat successful because the governor incorporated that prospectively in the budget. Uh, this bill is retrospective. So it goes back and there's a scale, a sliding scale, depending upon how long you've been closed and what the impact has been. But the chamber has been very helpful in working that bill through the legislature. Um, and all of you on the call from Orange County know that one of the things that this pandemic has taught us is the interrelationship between all things in the economy. Um, you know, the, the closure of Disneyland, now it's open, but it's, but the closure of Disneyland had second and third order impacts that I, I don't think, any of us fully realized, I'm not just talking about the employees at Disneyland, I'm talking about the businesses that depend on Disneyland and depend on tourism uh, for, its, for, for, for the vibrancy of their economy. And so all of us have taken a huge hit. Some have suffered more than others, but by virtue of the fact that Disneyland's closed and employees then move in together and they house together, which spreads COVID, which then taxes the healthcare system. It, it, it is, uh, there's a snowball effect and a, and a, um, in, increases sometimes the, the suffering increases exponentially. Anyway, that's a long way of not answering your question, but. but. Um, I do have one follow up kind of, it's, it actually, goes off at something that you just mentioned, and that is the unemployment. Mm -hmm. In California, we have had our fair share of unemployment problems. Um, right now, though, those problems seem to st stem from, and I was just watching actually the press conference from the White House and the jobs report that came out today. And I know that they were specifically asking um, cabinet member Yellen about the unintentional effects of the additional unemployment benefits. And I know that 
there are many businesses within my chamber and I know within our neighboring chambers that are hurting and trying to hire back their employees. Um, and some of the bigger businesses that have many, many, many employees right around the minimum wage or just their above um, range that are having a trouble getting their people back and hiring enough people. So do you have any ideas as to what we can do from here, where we can go? Is there a way to incentivize those people to come back to work or what that looks like in the near future? So, um, and I'm anxious to hear from, from you and, and what your uh, member businesses have to say about this. I just, this is just completely anecdotal. Is it um, talking to, uh, I, I, I still do practice law, although my partners don't really think I practice law, but I think I do. And, and I was just talking to a client yesterday that has a relatively large business um, uh, and they're having a great deal of difficulty. They've only been able to bring back about 30% of their workforce. Uh, and they attribute it to many things. You know, part of it is that 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 folks um, who um, say, you know, I can go back to work at X dollars per hour, or I can stay home and and I earn slightly less, but I'm not working, so maybe I'll take that trade. Well, uh, I, I don't think the answer is to cut off those kinds of benefits, but the answer is for us to to look at who's getting them. The answer is. I mean, there's always an economic answer. You always can pay more. If you pay more, then you know people will come. If the differential becomes larger, then people will come. But that decreases your profit margin and causes stress on the business. And whether the business can still survive is is an, is an issue. Um, one of the things that that we need to do is we need to, I think, to to step back and look and see what what benefits are being administered, who they're being administered to, and uh, what, what, what else we need to do to support businesses to bring people back. Uh, this problem has now gotten really acute, I think, in the last few weeks. The president mentioned it today. Uh, I said I'm interested in what your businesses are, are experiencing. Um, the, uh, besides the wage differential, at least I am informed that many employees have gone off to other businesses. So in other words, while they were paying $16 an hour or whatever they were being paid, you know, in um, at, at whatever they were doing before, they found a $16.50 job or they found a $15 job somewhere else, but now they're stable in another job and they don't want to return to the job they had before. So um, I'm solicitous of your ideas as well as to how we, how we get people back to work, back working. Thank you so much. Oh, go ahead. Thank no, you. And we will pull our um, ideas together. I know we're going to be meeting right. with you in your office soon. So we'll pass that information along. Thank you. Jennifer, did you want to? Yeah, I was just going to say thank you so much for that, Senator, and we'll be happy to engage as well. But also wanted to, uh, you know, thank you for SB 49 and the good work that the legislature has already done to really provide those small business grants, the PPP loan um, that was just passed to help offset that tax liability. And uh, with that, um, do you see any large uh, small business efforts coming down and maybe the May revise or any other legislation similar to what we've just seen kind of with the PPP loans and the small business grants or, or do you think, you know, it'll be more anecdotal or more uh, limited with regards to things like, you know, licensee uh, credits, uh, restaurants, uh, things that yeah. we're seeing on the legislation. Yeah. Uh, I, I realize that those are, are not game changer sort of, uh, uh, piece of legislation. That, Jennifer, that's a really good question. I, I just spent a long time talking to, well, uh, Assemblyman Tom Daly last night about this very issue. Um, and there's some disparity between the Assembly and the Senate in terms of our perception as to what um, is available. I, I think the Assembly believes that, that we're in better shape financially than the Senate. And I know for many of you that aren't government junkies, that doesn't make any sense that we're all one legislature, but there are differences between, and there's a, you know, the governor's, we don't know exactly what the governor thinks yet. We're going to find out here in the next few days when we see his May revised budget. But I think that all of us are pleasantly surprised that, that what we thought, you know, eight months ago didn't happen. Um, I am concerned that we're on a sugar high 
that that we think we've got a lot of money. We and we do have more money than we expected eight months ago, but that that to the extent it's one-time money that we don't program in expenses that that cause us three and four years out to have a great deal of difficulty with our budget. Um, I, I'm cognizant that some of my colleagues have introduced uh, tax measures, which I think and hope uh, won't go anywhere. Uh, this wealth tax thing has caused a lot of controversy. I, I, other than a lot of press reports, I don't think they'll be, I don't think they'll go anywhere. Uh, we don't, right now, you know, government always needs, wants at least more revenue, uh, but, but I, I don't see a path forward for those proposals. Uh, I'm not gonna support them. And I think that there's a critical mass that won't support them. Uh, but your question about, you know, what, what else is out there, we're gonna find out here in the next few days. Thank you so much for that. And I think, you know, your, your comment about taxes was something that I know Cindy was interested in. Cindy, did you have any follow-up on that issue that you wanted to ask the Senator? Yeah, welcome Senator. I'm honored to be here with you. Um, yeah, the dreaded tax questions. Um, we talk about it every month at our government affairs committee meeting and the state is an approximate 15 billion surplus and probably will get an updated numbers with the May revise. Under the American Rescue Plan, California will also receive approximately $26 billion. So it appears we have plenty of money. There have been several tax proposals introduced this year to increase personal income tax, wealth tax, and increase tax on international companies. Just the introduction of tax proposals does concern our businesses and may have the impact of encouraging more of our businesses to look to other states for areas of growth or relocation. And I know we've had several businesses leave California because of taxes and um, regulations. What are your thoughts on tax increases? And do you think the legislator will support new taxes in 2021? My thoughts are that uh, now's not a good time to pass tax increases. I'm not sure if there's ever a good time, but now's not a good time, number one. Number two is I think that they're not going anywhere. Um, Whenever someone proposes something like a wealth tax, I know that your phones light up, my phones light up. Um, I, I understand why people would be concerned and just the perception has a chilling effect on business, even if they're not ever effectuated. Um, but I, but I, I don't think it's gonna happen. Um, and in terms of local businesses, to the extent that that I can be an advocate for businesses either growing or remaining uh, among the chambers, the local chambers we have here, I'm, I'm happy to do so. Um, I mean, they, you know, ultimately solutions in terms of, of wealth, in terms of poverty involve uh, growing businesses. And so to the extent that I can be an asset in that cause, I'm, I'm happy to do so. Okay, so you fight against more taxes. Not, uh, yeah, <laughs> you don't I, want any more. Yeah. We, yeah. We, yeah. I, I, I mean, there's always, you know, things that happen, you know, I, I think that, you know, knock on wood that the pandemic now we're, you know, within eyesight of, of having businesses being able to be reopened. I think we're within, you know, months, uh, you know, like, two, three months of being back to some, something like near normalcy. And so, um, you know, if, if that continues, I don't, I don't think you're going to see any of these tax proposals go anywhere. Uh, and it's in businesses, by the way, let me just, as an aside, say that 95%, that's a number I just pulled out of my ear of businesses have been extraordinary during the pandemic. They have stepped up to the plate in terms of helping their employees. They've stepped up to the plate in terms of, of the community. I mean, I, I've got, you know, stories that bring tears to my eyes of, of businesses that are near shut down, but are still providing food and doing all kinds of wonderful things. There's a small number who have decided that they don't want to be compliant, that they do want to show up in the newspaper, that they're going to invite people to come to their restaurant and require them not to wear masks. Those are the businesses that get a lot of attention. And it's really sad. It's really sad for me that they get so much attention. 
but I think that, you know, uh, in very large part, folks have adhered to the guidelines and that's why we're doing okay. We're, that's why we're on the right road, especially in Orange County, we're on the right road to recovery. We're not quite there yet. We need to get our people vaccinated. You know, my own business, the issue of whether we're going to require vaccinations or not is a big deal. It's a really big deal. We've got, there are, there are now about uh, 30 of us. And so, you know, any business that has more than 10 employees has a certain number of employees that are vaccine hesitant. And we're, we're trying to address that. But, but uh, I think if, if we do a good job getting people vaccinated and, and keeping uh, with the CDC protocols here for a while, we'll be in much better shape. Thank you. Appreciate that. So switching topics on you a little bit from pandemic and small business challenges to another uh, uh, challenge that the state of California is facing very soon, uh, the lack of water, a drought, uh, an unquestionable drought on the horizon. I'm going to uh, turn it over to Manny to, to ask some questions on that issue. Sure. So I am an environmentalist at heart and have had a, a a lengthy career with environmental sustainability being at its core. And my prior life, I worked for one of the member agencies of the Metropolitan Water District. So water is always gonna be something that I'm uh, incredibly interested in. And as Jennifer just mentioned about the looming drought upon us, we've not seen much rain this year and a little bit last year, but are there active conversations taking place right now? And do you have a prediction about whether or not additional conservation measures are in our near future? And also where, what's the current status on different types of projects? I know Northern California is very interested in storage. Southern California is actively talking about recycled water, just seeking your input from the state, where you think we're heading. Uh, are there conversations? Yes, there are conversations. Um, you know, water, I, I suppose every issue is complex. Water is maybe more <laughs> complex than most. Um, and there's um, a, it's not a, it's not a partisan divide when it comes to water. It, it's a divide between, typically between agricultural and urban interests. Um, that has, that, that, that will remain a constant challenge. Uh, yes, um, th there are folks talking about in, in our own county, in, in Huntington Beach, as, as John knows, there's a, uh, an issue concerning a desalinization plant and whether or not it's necessary and, and whether it uh, is cost efficient and what, it's, what it does to the environment. Uh, that's a huge debate um, that, that is being waged right now locally and statewide. Uh, I, to answer your question, yes, are, are we concerned? Yes, are we talking about it? Yes. Yes, as to both those, as to what solutions we engage in, whether we do something with, uh, you know, the age-old peripheral canal. It's not called a peripheral canal anymore, but or whether we do something with desalinization, whether we do something with increased storage, whether we do something with uh, a different mix between ag and urban. All those things are being discussed. None of them have been resolved. But it's but. Um, but it's a, it's a critical issue. So, and as we see the snowpack is down, it's, we follow that, yeah. And the population continues to increase. You know, <laughs> that, that actually, Manny, that's a really good question. You know, our population, the, the perception is because of the recent census that our population decreased because we lost a congressional seat. And you, as you point out, that's not accurate. We are still growing. We're just not growing as fast as, for example, Texas but we're still growing. In fact, just as an aside, in my own little family, we've had three grandchildren in the last five months. So we're doing our part. So. <laughs> Congrats, that's amazing. That's awesome. Including you, one Senator. Wednesday. We just had one two days ago. So. Oh, yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thanks. I don't know many, if you had anything else, I didn't want to jump in, no. No, that's perfect. I appreciate it. Thank you, Senator. Yeah. You know, what, Jennifer, if, if I could, since, since I've got a captive audience here of people that are really smart and really in tune with, with what's going on um, in both the community as well as the business, you know, one of the things we're trying to gather are lessons learned from the pandemic. So, for example, let me give you two examples of things that we're working on. Um, 
we're carrying legislation. I know this is going to seem like it's really easy and really simple. That's to allow people who want to buy or lease cars to do so electronically. So you can buy or lease a car from home electronically. You can sign a contract electronically. Now that's not been done. And there's actually some very significant uh, opposition to that legislation. But what we've learned is, is that if people buy, and my, this is what I've learned, at least people aren't under any pressure if they're buying a car from their home. They can look at the screen, they can sign it, they can figure out what additions they want without somebody being right there with them. That's lesson one. Lesson two, there's many, but, but I'm just giving you some examples, is that I chair Judiciary Committee. My job is to help to support the courts and access to justice. Uh, there are courts in California that don't serve their notices electronically, which is nuts. We're trying to change that. Uh, there are if those of you who have been involved in litigation, you know, it's time consuming and incredibly expensive. It's too expensive and it, and it inhibits folks. I'm not just talking about those that are indigent, which is very, very prominent, but even, even, you know, mid-sized businesses from being able to resolve disputes because of the expense. So a bill to, for example, allow certain witnesses to testify remotely so that they don't have to come to court. That's gotten opposition. So we're, we're learning things and we're trying to move things um, ahead based on some of these lessons that we've learned. So I'm, I'm solicitous again, uh, I'm giving you lots of homework, I know, but I'm solicitous of other lessons we've learned here during the pandemic that we can either continue to implement or, or, or things that we in the legislature can do to, to support that. You know, I'll just take the opportunity, um, Senator, since you raised that, because I do think it is, you know, it, all businesses are doing kind of a look back on lessons learned through this pandemic, um, obviously hoping that we don't face another situation like this for, for many years to come. But nonetheless, um, you know, kind of readjusting as to maybe we never do get back to the total normal. Things have changed. People have adjusted in the last year. One of the biggest questions, I think, in addition to vaccinations and bringing uh, employees back is the whole return to work five days a week, or do you uh, do some type of hybrid with remote work, um, which I think a lot of employers are currently considering and trying to figure out how we do that. I'll just say our labor and employment laws have, have not necessarily kept up with the notion of a remote workforce, right? Most of the uh, employment laws are focused on an in-person physical location discussion. And uh, to your point about the the leasing of the cars and having that option to purchase electronically, a lot of the employment laws require uh, notices, postings, um, contracts to be also executed in person. And again, some of the same uh, issues that we've learned is that you know an employee who has to execute some type of agreement is much more comfortable doing it in their home where they have an opportunity to review outside the the purview of the employer. And and maybe you know what I mean as we relook at what the workplace looks like, some of those same issues, you know, are across the board in different policy areas, such as labor and employment. So, but we'll get back to you, of course, with more. And I don't know if any of our local chamber partners have anything to add to that before we move on to a different yeah. topic, but please go ahead. Well, you, you, and Jennifer, good point. I mean, this whole issue of vaccination, what do you require employees to be, I'm, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm sitting in our office right now. There are, we have office, we have, offices for, I think, for 16 basically lawyers and other offices here. Right now, there are four people in the office. And there are some people that are working extremely well remotely. Some people aren't working as well remotely. That's just probably like the other businesses that you encounter. Uh, and what do we do? I mean, with staff, you know, in terms of break time, lunch time, all those other laws that, that apply to the labor force, how do you enforce them? Uh, how do you modify them for a workforce that, that may, not, you know, may, not, may not be in the office? We've got, we just leased another six offices. We made that decision pre-COVID and now we've got six empty offices here. We have people, but we, they're just, you know, they're not really using the offices. So yeah, I mean, I, and the sad thing, or, or maybe it's sad, maybe it's not sad, is that I think all legislators, they take their personal experience and from that they extrapolate to the general case. I take my personal experience and extrapolate to the general case. When somebody told me the only thing worse than a legislator with no experience is a legislator with little experience, and maybe that's the case here, but, but I, 
I have a real sense of some of the challenges that we're going to be facing. That's actually a great um, segue into uh, John's question that I know you wanted to ask you about with regards to the labor employment laws and certainly your role as the Senate Judiciary Chair. John, do you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you, Jennifer. And, and Senator, thank you. It's, as Cindy said, it's an honor to be able to be on the panel with you today. Obviously, uh, as you mentioned, you're part of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And one of the things it's a major concern to all of our businesses, whether it's small or large, it doesn't matter what industry it's in, it could be in restaurants, it could be in um, automotive, whatever it is, is the um, Private Attorney General Act, the PEGA Act. And as we're seeing more and more employers being sued under PEGA, some of the questions that have come up is, is there a chance for reform? Is anything being done to look at that to protect uh, employers and of all sizes? And what is some of that legislature that's being looked at for potentially changing or modifying the current laws? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a good question. And, and the private attorney general actions, they are attendant to separate pieces of legislation. And so you know, I chaired Senate Judiciary. So that's one of my responsibilities. My responsibilities is to make sure that if we pass something, it's understandable. If we pass something, it's also enforceable. And how it is enforced is, is a critical question. Uh, thus far, the way that the laws that have come through since I've been chair have uh, been enforced uh, through what, what I would refer to as the Business uh, and Professions Code 17200. That's where a district attorney or a city attorney can actually enforce, enforce the, the law. And that adds an extra level of sort of responsibility. Uh, I, um, I mean, that's, just, that's a general observation. Uh, I am interested. I mean, I know that, that for example, in the area of Americans with Disability Act the lawsuits. There were that became a cottage industry for for certain lawyers to harass uh, businesses in, in ways that were um, unjust, inappropriate, and extortionate. And so that that did get modified. And to the extent that your businesses are experiencing that kind of uh, litigation. Uh, that's of interest to me. So I'll give you another homework assignment as you, you know, you can tell me what particularly odious um, experiences that you're seeing and, and, and let me know. Okay. By the end well, of this thing, you guys are going to, I'm going to give you enough to, you won't, you won't want to talk to me here for a long, long time because I've given you so many assignments. Don't threaten us. Right. We'll right. call you back. Right. All right. <laughs> So a follow-up question is, you know, Jennifer brought up some things and you did as well. Uh, as we start looking at coming out of COVID, opening up businesses, bringing employees back, um, what do you see as a potential for um, issues with, with PAGA and re, in relation to additional lawsuits for things such as mandating of vaccines? There's a lot of discussion about having yeah. the vaccine uh, passport um, exposure to employees, potential exposure to employees coming in. What do you yeah. see there? So uh, I, I hate the term vaccine passport because it's been politicized now. So you know whether or not a business can uh, require an employee. I mean, I can tell you what my personal point of view is. I, I don't know that there's legislation even pending. My personal point of view is, is a business can, uh, in order to protect its other employees, require folks unless they have a, a, a health concern. And there are people with health concern, not concerns, but a, but a health issue that, that precludes them from getting a vaccine or there's some deep religious issue, and I'm not sure what that would be, then, then my personal point of view is an employer can do that. And that, that would not subject the employer to litigation. Now query whether we put that in statute or not. Uh, and I realize that there are some very strong opinions uh, uh, about that issue. And, and I'm, I understand that there's some very strong opinions about that issue. There are very strong opinions about COVID enforcement. Um, I also understand, you know, and there's two different sectors. There's the business sector and the public sector in terms of uh, subjecting um, businesses and public institutions to liability for COVID related damages. Uh, and 
we're going to see something uh, soon as to schools and um, immunity. And, and I, I can only speak for myself. I, uh, I, although I chair judiciary, I have a very independent committee with very smart people. Jennifer's laughing uh, with very smart people who don't necessarily see things sometimes the way I see things. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the process, but as to schools, you know, schools that have done what they're supposed to do, they have tested their students, they have tested their, their, their teachers and their employees, and they've come back and they've come back to in-classroom learning as we've asked them to do, and they've done so in as safe a manner as they can, then they, they shouldn't be subject to uh, lawsuit. Um, it's a public good, something we require. And yet there are school boards in California that don't believe that the COVID virus is real. And so you've got this continuum. And so if you're a school board that basically says, we're not going to adhere to the guidelines, well, I'm not sure that those folks should then be immunized from the damage that may be a, of a, as a consequence of it. Um, and you know, I mentioned before, I don't know that we have any, Jennifer can help me out here. I don't know that we have any legislation concerning immunization of businesses, but you know, they, a business, and I keep, I brought this up before, but you know, a business that advertises in Los Angeles, come to my restaurant in Orange County where you may not wear a mask, uh, you know, they don't get immuni immunity, <laughs> but businesses that do whatever they can, that's a whole different question. Um, but you know what, I, I, let, me, let me ask you again, I've asked the school districts in my area, um, uh, just for those who may not be from, from the 34th Senate District, we have nine cities, we represent or North Central Orange County, as well as parts of Long Beach, that I've asked school districts, tell me if you've gotten lawsuits threatened, because I, I wanna know about that, I wanna know about that. And thus far we've only gotten, at least as of a couple of weeks ago, one report. But, uh, but same thing with businesses. I, no, I'd, I'd like to know. I didn't, John, I didn't want to jump in on you, but just kind of as a follow-up to some of those things um, that you mentioned, uh, Senator, with our homework assignments, which we are grateful to respond and give you, back to you. How, how important is it uh, to have that local voice, that local business voice um, uh, reaching out to you, contacting you about issues that they're having. I mean, I don't want to take away at, at all what we do at the state level as the as the state chamber, but how important is it to you to hear from these local businesses about the issues they're facing? Oh, it's critical. I mean, that's what I, I, I I'm sure I've got staff on here because they 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 supervise me, uh, but my they are my eyes and ears, and so I I take it very seriously. I take you know, being in touch very seriously. And, and when people bring us issues, um, I take that seriously as well. And one of the things that, uh, you know, sometimes the intervention of a legislator when, you know, I know none of you on this call have ever seen government do anything goofy, but sometimes government does goofy things. Sometimes they enforce things in a goofy way. And sometimes I had a boss one time when I was in Washington. And he said, never take stupid as an answer. If someone tells you something that makes absolutely no sense, don't take stupid as an answer. And so you need to intervene. And so sometimes we have intervened and I don't mind personally intervening, calling a state agency going, you know, that th this makes no sense, or you're holding up this, which is having a second and third order uh, impact. So to answer your question, your input is, as is evidenced by the homework assignments I've given you, it's, it's very important, number one. And number two, that's, I mean, those of us that are in public service, you too, I mean, you get, we're all in public service. I know you get pleasure out of helping a business achieve a certain goal. I know you do. Uh, that's what, you know, gets you up in the morning. And, and the same thing with us. That's what gets us up in the morning is, is helping out the people that, you know, we're responsible for in, in my Senate district. So. I see Zach Keller's just uh, chimed in <laughs> with his, his email address. There you go. So, Thank you for that. You uh, actually made a comment that um, wanted to direct us back to um, when you mentioned EDD and UI, you said goofy agency, and certainly the EDD has had its challenges this past year 
with the uh, unemployment benefits and uh, managing uh, the demand on the agency for those benefits. I think the most recent um, data shows that the uh, UI fund is approximately $26 billion in debt to the federal government. Um, they, they anticipate that by the end of everything, hopefully, you know, when we go back to normal, I guess maybe the end of this year, it could be as high as $40 billion in debt. And uh, as you are aware, that debt is paid off by increased in taxes on employers um, through the reduction of the federal tax credit. Um, and, and, and some of that money also we've learned obviously was through fraudulent actions. And so, um, you know, a huge concern of the employers is that tax isn't yet, but it's coming. We know it's coming. Um, we saw this when the recession happened and we were in debt, although the, the loan was much lower. I think it was approximately 10 billion, um, although I may be off on that number. So the, the size of the loan, the fact that we're facing that without any intervention by government, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Um, and I'll throw out, you know, obviously we also have money coming in from the federal American rescue plan. We have one-time money that we, you know, are expected to get, um, that we'll see in the May revise. What are your thoughts with regards to that debt and, and employer's responsibility for it? Uh, well, uh, this is, again, a huge issue. And many of my colleagues have looked at the EDD issue prospectively. What can we do to make sure that, that we either stop the bleeding or we don't have this kind of bleeding in the future? You know, cross-checking various records. You know, if, if a, a prisoner in a state prison is, is applying, doing that kind of, what, what seems to be fairly simple cross-checking prospectively. And, um, it's an embarrassment. I mean, the whole thing is an embarrassment. Just, it's just an embarrassment. And um, employers should not bear the brunt of this embarrassment. In my own situation, oh, by the way, I should thank you, Jennifer. And I should thank the chamber. Um, I have looked back, partly based on my um, history, uh, as to how we can get back some of this money. And, and we have a bill that uh, puts the AG in charge and helps support others in the investigation and prosecution. But I'm more, most interested in restitution. And I realize that you know, a lot of this money is now in the, uh, in the Caribbean or other places where we can't get to it. But, but there are estimates as to as much as $10 billion that we, that we may be able to recover as much as $10 billion. Well. That may not seem like much money to you guys, but that's that that's that's a fair amount of money, um, and so that's what we. In fact, I, I, Zach and and others were on the phone this morning. We're working with the AG's office to see how we can do this as efficiently as is possible, and that's the challenge. The challenge is to create an efficient mechanism to go after uh, both the criminals, but also the 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 assets to to bring them back. Uh, to identify bank accounts, to identify Maseratis, to identify other things that that we can um, that we can get back. And I and I and I some folks have disparaged this effort because they say, well, you know, it's only maybe there's forty billion dollars in fraud, and you know, it's it's relatively small percentage. There's two purposes: one is to get the money back, and two is to send a message that we're not going to allow folks who steal. Uh, get away with it. So. Well, those efforts are appreciated to the extent that we can get down that that outstanding loan and balance any any reduction in that obviously offsets the tax exposure and liability that businesses of all sizes will certainly be facing. So we appreciate that. Thank you, Senator. Um, I know the other topic that um, uh, some participants in memory, I think, wanted to um, talk about is housing. Housing in California, another challenge <laughs> that we're facing. Um, and I know there's always tension between local government and the state government on that issue, um, not enough housing, uh, sequel litigation, all sorts of issues surrounding that. Memory, did you wanna jump in and ask a question on that? Sure, thank you. Um, in Fountain Valley currently, and I know as well in Huntington Beach and in Costa Mesa, pretty much everywhere, we are struggling with the RENA numbers that have been mandated on the cities. And uh, it's gotten pretty contentious at some of our city council meetings. Uh, you know, residents don't want to see high rise stack and pack sort of establishments. Is there any way 
that is it's too costly for a city like ours to try and challenge the state. So is there any recourse we have? It's this mandate that many have seen as unconstitutional because there's no funding behind it. Um, so do the cities have any kind of recourse? Is there any room for negotiations? I mean, I think in Fountain Valley, we were looking originally at about 900 to 1,000 additional units, and we are now charged with 4,800 in a city that's almost completely built out. So what are your thoughts on that? And do you have any recommendations for us on the city level on where we can go and what we can do in that regard? Thank you. So, uh, and this is a, a thorny issue, and you guys are right in the middle of it. Uh, the, the chambers uh, are, are right in the middle, uh, especially the local chambers are right in the middle because, uh, for example, the Orange County Business Council, which is a, uh, an excellent organization, their number one priority, I think, is still housing because of the impact on businesses trying to attract and retain employees because of the high cost of housing. And the only way to reduce the cost of housing over the long term is not to build, you know, you can only have so many government sort of subsidized or government built and units. It's to increase the supply overall. So how do we increase the supply overall? In a place like Fountain Valley with this ridiculous RENA number um, or your neighbor in Seal Beach with even a more ridiculous RENA number, uh, how, how do we how do we deal with that? Uh, and to the answer your question, is there is there room for negotiation? Sure, there's room for negotiation. SB fifty, which was uh, you know the uh, predecessor to some of the legislation that's pending this year, didn't pass because people were concerned about what the impact would be on neighborhoods. Is there a place where there's a happy medium, where cities are doing their part? Uh, to address the housing issue and, and in, in an equitable fashion. We have in Orange County, um, as I think you, you all on the, on the Zoom call know, the cities that you represent where you have businesses, they're sometimes in conflict with South Orange County because cities in our part of the county are, are doing their part or at least attempt to do their part. And some other cities have just blown it off for years. Uh, and and how to resolve you know my my personal point of view is is that it's it's a burden that not a burden it's a responsibility that that every every city should share in equitably um, that same thing with homelessness and and we talked with your council members in Fountain Valley about the homeless crisis that is increasing dramatically um, and. You know, is that is that simply Santa Ana's responsibility or is it the region's responsibility? Well, you probably know what I think. So, um, and is it fair for a city like Fountain Valley to get credit if they contribute to transitional housing in um, in Santa Ana? Perhaps so. I, I carried a bill a year and a half, two years ago, uh, to convert motels and hotels, motels mostly. You know, as you drive down, for example, Beach Boulevard, and you see some of the rundown motels to convert that into transitional housing uh, was this, what I thought was a simple bill. It simply said that if you are converting it to transitional housing, which means you're putting in a kitchen, that's all it really means is you got it to, to create sort of semi-permanent housing. You have to have a cooking facility, a kitchen. So that would take about 10% of the square footage. And the bill simply said you are exempt from CEQA if you uh, only increase the square footage by 10% and you're adding basically a kitchen facility. Oh my goodness. When the, the CEQA exemption created a, a, a flurry of activity uh, and a lot of it was using the camel's nose under the tent argument, which I'm not a big fan of, uh, but it was a common, the governor did sign it, ultimately sign it. Uh, but but uh, some cities, Long Beach, I, I think Jeremy's, I saw some something in the chat from Jeremy. Long Beach was actually a sponsor and Long Beach is really using it quite a bit. Um, I would encourage other cities and I'm gonna see if I can't get more money in the budget to assist other cities in doing exactly that. 
Um, when, when we part company here, Jennifer will know this person. I'm talking to Nancy Skinner about that very subject. So. Hit the wrong button. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Senator. That's, uh, that was a, a good effort. And it seems like the governor has embraced some of that with some of the projects he's been doing on room key and home key he as has. well. He I, has. I want more money to come to our area. So that's what, the, that's what our conversations are about. Yeah. You know, uh, one last question, and because we're hitting up against the time, so, um, but it's related to housing and, and the need for more housing, to build more housing, and of course, the challenge with uh, the wildfires that California uh, unfortunately faces uh, and will likely continue to face, and the designation of so many uh, lands and available land as high fire severity Hi, did I say that right? High fires, yeah. severity zones, thank you. Uh, how those two intersect and kind of butt up against each other with regards to development and where, where, and, uh, where we can build and uh, provide more housing. So any thoughts on that? So uh, Bill Dodd has a bill that, that just came through judiciary. And this is inside baseball, I realize that uh, Senator Dodd on, on things like trying to address some of the challenges in, in the high fire probability intensity, I don't remember the exact term either, by, by uh, greater employment of controlled burns, by greater employment of, of other um, resources to change the, the, the designation so that we can build in more areas. Um, I mean, that's, there's, it, it's sort of a, a zero sum game in the sense that you, there's no more land being made so we've got to find places where we can build. And you don't want to build in an area that, that you know or reasonably should know is going to have a fire event here. So you have to decide either you're not going to build or you're going to reduce the probability of having a fire event. Well, for housing purposes, as, as Senator Dodd has taken it upon himself, is to reduce the probability of a fire event so you can, you can build in certain areas. Um, the, the while all of California is uh, subjected to fire issues, uh, Northern California has had at least more intense fire issues in the last couple of years. Though we've not been immune, even Orange County, San Diego's had some real challenges. But that's and that's the equation. That's that's the equation. So, well, we appreciate that. Well, we are up against our time, Senator. Um, so I just wanted to thank you again uh, for participating today on this discussion. As you can see through the chat and comments, uh, so many people are, uh, are thanking you and congratulating you and, and um, appreciating your, your uh, time here today. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you for your continued support of the business community. And with that, we will uh, end our discussion for today, unless any of our local chamber colleagues have anything else to add. No? Okay, Senator. Well, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate well, thank it. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, and I look forward to the completion of all your assignments. So, all right. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thank you, thank you all. Bye-bye.